want you to take your Bible and leave it open to Matthew chapter 17. We're looking at all 13 verses really, but there's one specific part of this passage uh, that stands out to us. In fact, our text that was read to us today, it was also included in two other Gospels, the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke. And you may be saying, why is that really important to note? Well, if it's in the Bible three different times in three different passages, then I think it's important for us to understand Jesus wanted us to take note of what happened in this passage. It's called the transfiguration. Have you ever heard of that term? Transfiguration. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but let's ask the question, what is the transfiguration? Why did it occur? Why did Jesus allow for his disciples, a few of them, to be there with him? Now you have to take yourself back to the previous text because if you go back, what you find is Jesus told his disciples that he was going to go up to Jerusalem, and when he went there, he was going to die. But we must remember something about that event. Jesus was God in the flesh when he said that. He was 100% man, but he was 100% God. If that blows your mind, that's okay. It blows my mind too. It's a very hard thing for us to understand. But what it does tell us is that when Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die, it tells us that he was making those statements not just as God, but he was making those statements as a man. And that means that Jesus would face temptation just like you and I face temptation. Jesus would be hungry just as you and I are hungry. Why? Because Jesus was fully human. And so as a result of that, Jesus did not look forward to the cross. In fact, we read in the Gospels where he said, Lord, if there's any other way for this to happen, then let it be. And so it's not something that he was looking forward to. However, he knew that in order to do God's will, that he must endure the cross. And so all of this is on the mind of Christ. He is telling his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, I'm going there to pay the penalty for the sins of the entire world. And Jesus knew he was getting himself ready for some of the adversity that he was going to face. Satan would be attacking him, he would be tempting him, just like he was going to be attacking and tempting his disciples as well. So when we come back to the question, what was the transfiguration, why did it happen, and who was it for, I think we can say that the transfiguration was not just for Jesus. Yes, it was to prepare him for the adversity that he was getting ready to face. But it was also something that happened for the disciples, to prepare them for the fact that Jesus was getting ready to go to Jerusalem, and he was going to die. And immediately following that event, Jesus takes the opportunity to take Peter, James, and John with him high up on a mountain to this event that we have called the Transfiguration. And it begins in verse 2. And I, I want you to read with me in verse 2 through verse 9 because I want us to unpack this and see what's taking place here. And again, remember, Jesus as a human has all of these emotions and all of these things mind as well as his disciple. And then this takes place in verse 2. And it says, and Jesus was transfigured before them. That would be Peter, James, and John. And his face did shine as the sun, and his remnant was white as the light. Verse 3, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses, Elijah, talking with him. Verse 4, and answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three tabernacles, he says, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And then in verse 5, he says, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud and said, and I want you to underline this, this is God speaking now, God says, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And there's an important thing there at the end of that verse, verse 5, I want you to circle, because God tells everyone listening there to listen to what Jesus is getting ready to say. Now that's something we often miss here in the transfiguration, but God speaks, he says, this is my son, and he adds that statement there, listen to what he has to say. 
Then in verse 6, he goes on, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. So suddenly they hear God's voice. They had noticed that Moses and Elijah was there, but now suddenly they're gone. And then in verse 9, he gives us the instruction. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Now this brings me back to the question I just presented a minute ago. Why did this transfiguration take place? Who really would this have been for? What was the purpose? That's what we have to ask ourselves. As we look at this text, what was the purpose of the transfiguration? I want you to think about something for a minute. At the transfiguration, we witness Christ as the fulfillment of the law and prophets. At that moment, he has totally fulfilled all of the law and everything that the prophets said was to come. He's standing there between Moses and Elijah. But I ask myself when I read this passage, who benefited from this? I have to know that. I have to answer that question. Who was this for? Was it really more for Jesus? Or would it have been more for Peter, James, John? I go back to what I said earlier, and that is it was for all of them. We typically think of the transfiguration of being something just for Jesus. But in reality... Transfiguration was a preview of Jesus' second coming. Did you know that? It's a picture of that. It's a glory of his kingdom that one day is going to come. But ultimately, it was designed to strengthen not only Jesus, but to strengthen his disciples that was with him there that day. Now, this is interesting because only three disciples had been chosen to go with Jesus up on this mountain. They did not know when they went that day that Jesus was going to face the transfiguration. But it changed their life forever. This happened for the purpose of preparing Jesus. It happened for the purpose of preparing his disciples. Why? Because they would face adversity that they had never faced before. And how many times have you heard me say, standing here, that no matter how long we have lived or how long we will live, <clears throat> that we're going to face difficult challenges in our life? We call that adversity. <clears throat> that is a fact of life that we all must face. It's almost as though we could stand there with Jesus that day at the transfiguration, and he would say to us, I'm allowing you to see my glory. I'm allowing you to see who I really am. I'm allowing you to hear God speak from heaven <clears throat> and say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. It's as though God says that to them, to Jesus, and to us to say, I'm doing this because you're going to face adversity in life. And when you face that adversity, I want you to think back. And so this story, this passage, this time of transfiguration, it's a time that prepares all of us, even Jesus, for adversity. But what do we learn from it? How does it prepare us? Well, there's three simple things in this passage that prepare you and I, just like it prepared Jesus and these three disciples for adversity that will come. And I want you to take note of these three things. They're in your bulletin. I want you to write them down. And I want you to ask the question, would this describe me in my relationship with Jesus Christ? What is the first thing that we see in this passage? Number one, we must cultivate a listening heart. If we are going to be prepared for adversity that happens in our life, we must have a heart that is willing to listen to God. Now, what does that look like? Well, it's a, it's a stage, it's a, a time where you develop your heart, where you're willing to listen to God. I could probably ask many of you today, when was the last time God spoke to you? And you would look at me like a deer in the headlights and say, well, God has never spoken to me. And I would look back at you and I would say, oh, God should have spoken to you. God has spoken to you. If you've been listening, I can assure you God has promised us that he will speak to us. And so ask yourself the simple question. 
Has my heart been cultivated in a way that I actually listen for and to the voice of God? Let's get back in this passage just a little bit. Because Jesus takes three of his closest friends, three of his closest disciples, to spend time with him. Why? He's going up here to be transfigured. This was a time for Jesus to spend being in God's presence. Jesus knew that. Disciples did not. And Jesus wanted Peter, James, and John to understand what it would be like to see Jesus not only in his glory, but also to be in the presence of God. Now here's an interesting thing I want you to know. In Luke's gospel, we didn't read Luke's gospel today, but in Luke's gospel, and it adds this one detail, it tells us that during the transfiguration that Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. You don't see that in Matthew's gospel. But in Luke's gospel, it says specifically he was going up there to pray. Now, why do I tell you that? Because that gives us a great example of what it means to listen to the heart of God. If Jesus was God, but Jesus is fully man, and he wanted to get away with his closest friends and go up to this mountain for the purpose only to pray, what does that tell us? But I should. It means simply this, if prayer is not part of our life as a Christian, we should not be surprised when we do not hear God speak to us. It's because our heart is not listening, our heart is not prepared. Prayer is such a major piece of the Christian life that we cannot look at. Henry Newman said this, speaking of prayer and getting alone with God and cultivating our heart to listen to God, He said, solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusions of the false self. He went on to say, in solitude, we find the courage to let go of our self-image and our grip on life and follow God's will for our lives. What is he saying? He is saying there's something about solitude. There's something about getting alone with God. Most of us today would admit that our prayer life consists of this. When I wake up in the morning, I may or may not say a little prayer. I don't really spend quality time with God. Certainly before every meal, we thank God for that meal, but we really don't throughout that day spend quality time with God. I like to take it a step further. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. We are so afraid of silence that we chase ourselves from one event to the next in order to not have to spend time, spend a moment alone with ourselves, in order not to have to look at ourselves in the mirror. Now that's a powerful statement because that's what prayer will do. Prayer will convict us. God will speak to us. Prayer will challenge us. And so we must ask ourselves, as a Christian, has our heart been cultivated to where we're really listening to God? It will never happen if prayer is not part of our life. We must be willing to get alone with God. Now here is the challenge for you, and it really comes in the form of a question. I'm not asking you, do you pray? I'm asking you, has your heart been cultivated to the point where you have spent some quality time alone with God in prayer. And you may ask today, well, how long should I do that? Well, you've missed the point. You're not setting a timer. You're saying, I want to see a glimpse of God's glory, just like the apostle Peter, James, and John did when they went up on that mountain. God's glory was revealed in Christ. Go back to our text in verse 1. I, I want you to get a glimpse of this. and Notice what the Bible says as he's walking up there on this mountain. In verse 2 it says, There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. What happened at that moment? Jesus went to spend some time praying. The disciples, a few of them, had an opportunity to witness that, and what they witnessed was Jesus was in the presence of God the Creator. And they witnessed just a glimpse 
of that glory. But that happened only because Jesus went and spent time in prayer. Now, why is that so important? Well, if the Son of God, Jesus, would get away from everybody and all people and go away to pray, how much more important would it be for you and I as Christians to make that a priority in our life? I mean, let's be honest, we live in a world of distraction. True? Very, very distracting. I was telling my Sunday school class this morning, I just laughed. I turned on and heard a congressional hearing, and they're talking about aliens and and all of this stuff. And and I'm saying, well, it's just people are, they have lost their ever-loving mind. We are are living in a world where there's nothing but chaos, and, and we're looking for the next big thing that could happen that could just shake up the world. And so if there's ever a time where we should get away from all of that and spend some time with God, I think today is a great time. How do we do that? Well, in 30 seconds, I'm going to tell you how. And this is very important. There's three parts to this. Number one, it's meditation. You have to learn to meditate in his presence. What does that look like? When we think of meditation, generally we think of just being deep off in our thoughts, and that's not what it is at all. I've taught people to meditate many times, just read scripture and meditate on what that scripture's saying. You're better off to read one verse of scripture and meditate on that verse of scripture than try to cram a bunch of scripture in in your meditation time. But what are you doing during that meditation time? We're reminding ourselves of God's glory, of who he is. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, Jesus said this, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That is a verse to meditate upon. It can even be part of your prayer as you're praying, Lord, today as I meditate upon your word, I am reminded that you said I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Why is that important? Because we as Christians need to be reminded of that. So we meditate on that through our prayer. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20 Jesus said, surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So you know what I say to that? Let the aliens come. Jesus said, I'm going to be with you always. If it's part of his plan, let him come. I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to stay up at night worrying about it. I'm going to spend my time praying about things that really matter. And so we're going to meditate in his presence. Secondly, you would meditate on his power. It's not just who he is, but remind yourself when you're praying about what he can actually do. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 89, 13, your arm is endued with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand is exalted. That's a verse to meditate upon and remind ourselves that God is all powerful. He is all knowing. There is nothing that can happen in my life that God is not aware of. Thirdly, We meditate on his purpose in our life. Maybe the question could be asked this way. God, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? What are you doing in my life? Remember, we was talking about adversity. What about suffering? You know, I can say with all assurance today that God always has a purpose for suffering. Did you know that? The bad things that happen, the suffering, the trials and the tribulation, that God actually has purpose in that. I never said God caused it, but God certainly allowed it. And because he allowed it, it means that he has a purpose in allowing those storms in your life. The Apostle Peter said it this way, in case you don't believe that, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, And I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, though now for a little while you may have to suffer griefs of all kinds of trials. And they're going to come and they're going to challenge your faith. He says that they're going to teach you. God gives them for the purpose of not just challenging your faith at times, but increasing your faith. Now, if you're anything like myself, I would gladly say, God, keep all the troubles away and I'm fine with wherever my faith is at right now. All those trials and tribulations and things out of my life, but God allows those to happen. Well, let's get back to asking this question. What must I have as I face adversity? Well, what did Jesus give his disciples? Secondly, number two, 
quiet the noise that is around you. That means get away from it. The busy world and all the stuff that's going on in your life, quiet the noise that is around you. Do that practically in the world that we live in. I have found that most times I can lay down when it's quiet and it's still not quiet. Or I try to lay down so it's quiet and it's still not quiet. There's always distracting things that are around us. Well, look at verse 4. What Jesus is saying to them, stop talking and listen. Verse 4. He says, Lord, is it good for us to be here? Now, that's the apostle Peter asking a question. If you wish, he says, I will put up three shelters, tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, we're back in our text here, and, you know, the Apostle Peter always had something to say. This man was never quiet. You read that in Scripture. And so in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9 and verse 33, Luke says this about the Apostle Peter. He said he didn't know what he was saying. He just felt like he had to say something. And so he throws this out there. He has to be the spiritual one, right? God's doing something. They're in the presence of God. And here's the Apostle Peter saying, somebody should say something. Let's I suggest we build some shelters or some tabernacles here. The way that was Peter's custom, always to get a little bit ahead of God. Now, it's funny because the apostle Peter was probably thinking, I kind of like this worship experience. Let's not go back down off this mountain. Let's stay up here. We have God. We have Jesus. Moses and Elijah is here. And, you know, it's us guys, just us guys. Let's just stay here and worship a little while. Well, it may have sounded good to the Apostle Peter, but it didn't sound good from God's perspective on the situation. And we know that because we get to verse 5 and notice God says something to get our attention. And it says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice came out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I can just imagine the Apostle Peter saying, what did I just do? What did I just say? When am I ever going to keep my mouth shut? But let's ask a question here. Why were they terrified? I mean, it says that these disciples are afraid. What, what is there to be afraid about? Well, there's a couple of reasons why they would have been afraid. I can assure you, if you hear God's audible voice today, you're going to be afraid. If you ever hear the voice of God audibly, which you won't in this lifetime, but if you did, I want to tell you something, it would strike fear in you that you would never forget. But it wasn't just that God spoke. It's what God said. These apostles, the closest men to Jesus, have just heard him say, I'm going to go and I'm going to die for the sins of the world. The apostle Peter just rebuked him for that and said, no. I don't like that plan. There has to be a better plan. Now they're up on this mountain and God says to them, this is my son. Listen to what he's saying. That was a defining moment in their ministry. All because they chose to get alone with Jesus while he was praying and it changed their life forever. Now I want you to notice what Jesus says here. Two things, verse 7. Jesus came and he touched them and he says two things, underline these. He says, get up and he says, don't be afraid. Why? Why would Jesus say those two things? Well, it's a great lesson for us because usually when fear comes over us or adversary comes over us, what's the first thing we do? We become fearful. We become doubtful. We begin to question God. We begin to ask God why these things are happening in our life. But Jesus says to them, the scariest thing that could have ever happened has just happened to you. You heard the voice of God, but God said for you to listen to what I'm saying to you. And he is saying you need to have courage because of the things that you face. What was the second point in this message? Quiet the noise around you. Jesus had to take Peter, James, and John to the top of a mountain for God to speak, for them to see Moses and Elijah, for them to understand this principle. I've got you away from all the noise. Now I'm going to show you 
what's really important in your life, and that is that I will be with you. And if you don't think that's true, every one of the disciples, except John the Apostle, died a martyr's death. Every single one of them. John died of old age. They tried to martyr him many times, but every one of them was willing to lay down their life for Christ. Why? Because they knew he was the Son of God. Now, there's one final thing here that I want us to look at before we leave today. One final point. Number three, and that is to wait on God. I could have gone all day without saying that, right? Wait on God. When adversity comes into your life, when problems come into your life, what's the answer? Wait on God. Look at verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen. That's an odd request. But I want you to underline the very next thing that he says. Until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. They are hearing now for the first time Jesus say, I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised from the dead. And God the Father just said to them, listen to what he is saying to you. They're going to see this in a whole new light in a way that they never have. Now, we've heard Jesus say this, by the way. Don't tell anybody what you witnessed me do. But I want you to notice that Jesus reminds them not to to tell anyone until after the resurrection of Christ. Why is that? He's reminding them and telling them that everything that they believe in their Christian faith comes down to one simple principle, and that is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. You know what we call that today? Gospel. It's the only thing that can change our life. It's the only thing that we can count on in this life. The fact that if Jesus himself overcame death, there is no problem in this world that he cannot help us through. What do we do when we're in those dark times in our life? We meditate on his word. We meditate on his promises. We meditate on what he has done before. We we develop a heart that's willing to listen to God. We get away and we quiet all the noises that are around us because let me tell you something, when you're going through things in your life as a Christian, there will be many people there to tell you what you should do in that time. And what you really need to be concerned about in those times is what does God want because of this situation? If God has allowed this in my life, this is for his honor and his glory. And here's the hard part. As painful as it is, and as much as I don't understand about this, how can I submit my will to his and pray a prayer like this and say, God, I don't understand what you're doing in my life. I give it to you. I submit it to you that you can use for your honor. I tell you, church, we'll never get there until we develop and cultivate a heart that truly wants to listen what God wants. We'll never get there until we can get to the place where sometimes we can get away from all the distractions and all the noise. And then when we get to that place, we don't tell God what the plan's going to be. But we wait. How long do we wait on God? Well, I'm not God. I can't answer that question. You can trust that he is sovereign, he is just, he is holy, And he knows what's best for your life. And so when you leave here today, I want you to think about whatever it is you're facing in life, the the greatest things that you're facing in life. Ask this question. Am I willing to wait for God to do what God wants to do in this situation? That he already knows all about. And pray that it would bring God glory. I hope you can. That's a big task.